Chris has been very active in the Gulf Breeze community. You guys probably read the bio. He's a graduate of Georgetown University. He got his medical degree from there also. So any Hoya basketball fans. Um, he's originally from Boston, huge Red Sox fan, and um, did his um, medical training in New York City and also in Long Island and was a, a Navy veteran and has been here in the area really, I think, since 2004. His specialty is on the shoulder side, so he treats a lot of athletes and a lot of younger kids, unfortunately, and then also does a lot of surgery and uh, treats a lot of old people like your parents and me, um, as also also some of the elderly folks. So I really want to express our sincere gratitude for Dr. to Dr. O'Gray for hosting this tonight. This is very nice of him and the Andrews Institute to host this, and uh, I think you're going to come away kids learning a little bit more about some of the common shoulder injuries, parents, what not to do. And kids, what I would tell you is it's your arm and it's your responsibility to, to keep uh, your body in tune. So hopefully you learned something out of this. He'll take some question and answers at the end, and then we'll have a tour uh, next door to the training facility. All right? Thanks. All right. Thanks. Since it's probably hard for a lot of you to listen to that since most of you know me anyway, and you've known me before, uh, Paul just told you all that stuff. So just forget about that. I'm Michaela's dad. I'm Patrick's dad. I'm Hannah's dad. I'm a baseball coach. I'm looking at the weather like you guys because I got a 715 start up at the street. So, you know, I, I've talked to a lot of people individually. I've seen some of you guys in my office. I've seen some of your siblings in my office. And so, you know, th there's a lot of talk about throwing, how much can you throw, what's safe, what's not safe, what is an injury, what's a good one, what's a bad one. And so, you know, with what we do here, you know, what you guys hear about is the people that we're operating on here. Um, you know, and it's cool to know that these people are in our town, but you don't want to be them. Okay, you, you, you don't, you know, it's, it's fun to meet these athletes, but you don't want to meet them because if they're here, it's because something is going wrong. And so unless they're a Yankee, I'm never real happy about it. So I think that it would be a shame that if you guys grew up in this town where Dr. Andrews does all this surgery and all these Tommy John surgeries, if you didn't understand kind of the basics of injury prevention and why we have pitch counts. Because everyone knows, especially at your level and the way that they exist, but why? Is there any science behind it? So I'm going to kind of quickly go through a bunch of slides and then we'll, we'll cut a break and we'll go out and take a walk through Exos. So this is a busy slide, but it basically shows the uh, number of Tommy John surgeries per year going back to the mid-70s. And so I don't care what grade you're in, you, you all know what this bar graph means, and it is skyrocketing in about the last 12 or 15 years, okay? There's all kinds of, of statistics on the bottom and talking about what might be causing that, but the bottom line is this. The real reason for the spike in this is, is, unfortunately, the popularity of things like the wave, okay? The wave's awesome, and, and year-round baseball can be good, but there are dangers, and so if you're going to be competitive at this level, it's even more important than your buddies in rec ball to understand that there's a limit to what the human body, especially the growing human body, can tolerate. And that doesn't matter whether you're 12 years old or you're a 22-year-old professional. The things that you guys need to understand, those of you who are pretty much all of you in this room, are not yet what we would call skeletally mature. You're still growing, okay? And when you're still growing, you have growth plates. And when you have growth plates, you have different injury patterns than adults. And so there are things that we look at differently in the younger throwers and the older throwers. So this is the part I'll see if I can make anybody puke after I gave you food. Anyway, this is a cadaver shoulder. And it's, it's a study that we do. A lot of times we'll, we'll go to cadavers, all right? This is the inside of what your shoulder looks like. What it shows is this tendon coming over attaching to the labrum. This is where a slap tear occurs, and, and we do all kinds of biomechanical things, twisting the arm around, getting it to do different things, and seeing what maybe causes injuries, how much force, what vector, et cetera, et cetera. So a little leaguer shoulder. If you look on the right here, this crooked line is normal. That is a growth plate. That is the growth plate of the proximal humerus, top part of your shoulder. That's what it's supposed to look like in a young, healthy guy growing, okay? On this side, obviously different. Don't need to go to medical school to see that one side looks different than the other. 
and that is classic little leaguer shoulder. And so this is technically a fracture, okay? Most of the time it doesn't occur with one pitch where something snaps. It can, but more often than not, this is what we call repetitive microtrauma. Pitch after pitch after pitch after pitch, and that as you come back, and you rear back to get your velocity, your arm is getting twisted like a candy cane. And the force goes through here, and if there are too many pitches, too much force, or a combination of all of it, you end up getting a growth plate injury. The symptoms really are pain. A little bit of soreness everybody here has had, especially the pitchers after you pitch, okay? A little bit of soreness, put it on put ice, do the appropriate amount of rest, and that's you know pretty much all you should expect. If you're having pain at your age while you're throwing, you've got to stop. You have to listen to your body, okay? This is not the sort of thing where no pain, no gain is a good idea when it comes to your throwing arm, okay? Sometimes we don't ever actually see pain. What we see in the older kids is that all of a sudden they can't throw as hard, they can't throw as accurately, and that oftentimes in the big league pitchers is the only thing that we'll see. The good news, rest is all you need, okay? The human body is a pretty amazing thing, especially in our younger athletes. And if you can stop throwing, it will heal, period, amen. The magic question is, how long? I've been asked that so many times, I, I can't, you know, I'm not even gonna stand here and try to remember because I always give the same answer, which is, I don't know. Because depending on how severe the microtrauma is, it might be two weeks, it might be two months. And so oftentimes, you know, I'll say, hey, if it doesn't hurt, try to gradually go back to throwing. And when they do, it hurts, they come back and say, well, I rested it. What happened? Well, you got to rest it again. Doesn't seem very scientific, but that's all it is. You're just giving your body a chance to heal, okay? So little leaguer's elbow is basically the same thing, okay? There are growth plates all over the elbow, and until you're about 14 or 15 years old, these things don't fuse, and you get injuries to the growth plates before you get injuries to the ligaments. The symptoms, pain on the inside part of the elbow, trouble with effectiveness, control, speed, and you know, most of the time this is one of those things that just kind of aches, it just kind of aches, and then every once in a while you have one that just pops. Okay, and what that, what that pop is, is this piece of bone, which is called the medial epicondyle, just pops off. One hard throw. So when you are rearing back in the cocking phase of your throwing and you're getting all that velocity, all the force that is actually generated from your legs through your core as you turn your body through the motion of your arm, it's all going through this one little tiny area, okay? This is the, where the Tommy John lig ligament lives. It attaches to that piece of bone and runs down to the ulna right there, okay? Until this fuses, the weak spot is actually right here. And so until you have a skeletally mature elbow, more often than not, we're worried about the growth plate. As soon as that thing starts to fuse around 13, 14, then you're really stressing the ligament, and that's when you have issues with Tommy John. All right, same thing, rest, it's all you need to do. If it's a bony injury, it's a piece of bone, it's a piece of bone, they will heal to each other with no problem, even when you pop it off. Sometimes it pops off and it moves, we've got to put a little screw in it, no big deal. So until you're skeletally mature, the answer is basically you're, you're, you're kind of lucky in a way, even though it's irritating to hear you can't throw a baseball. Most of the time, that's the only treatment you need. Just stop until it's not hurting anymore. Because when you get older, you get into a little bit more trouble because when things start to tear, they don't heal as well. And that's what Tommy John surgery is. So this is a drawing of that x-ray I just showed you with what's called the ulnar collateral ligament. It's the Tommy John ligament. It's, as I said earlier and showed you that slide, it's dramatically increasing the number of young people who have this injury. It's, it's really kind of scary to see. I trained in New York City with a surgeon who took care of the Mets, and in five years of training, I saw two Tommy John surgeries. Dr. Andrews will do six in a day here when he's busy on all ages. There'll be a 14-year-old, there'll be a sophomore at Gulf Breeze, and then there's, you know, a pro right next to him. But it's really more often now we're seeing them in bulk in people who are under 18 years old. So there's a picture of Andy Pettit, great pitcher, 
all right? Great mechanics. There's the stress. You can see how fast that arm is moving. It's blurring. All the force of this huge man's body is going through that little ligament, all right? So it's repetitive near failure, meaning it's, he's throwing so hard that that ligament's almost going, almost every time, but obviously it doesn't. And so it's the micro trauma of many, many, many throws when you get this, and the yellow arrow is pointing to the lack of black line. This black line should go and connect, but it's not there anymore. So treatment for partial injuries, we can get away with rest a lot of the times. Oftentimes it stretches a little bit too far, and we do some different things with injections of PRP and stem cells, and there's a whole other hour-long talk on that treatment. But this is the one you don't want, the complete injury, okay? When you, when you completely tear this thing, you can't throw anymore. The ironic thing is, is that you only need it to throw. And so if you're a football player and you're not the quarterback and you have a tackle where something goes bad and you pop your UCL, you don't need it. If you're a dentist, you don't need it. You only need it to throw. And so unlike, say, labral tears and things that might prevent you from going on and working and we have to fix all those injuries. The number of Tommy John surgeries is happening only in people who throw and want to continue throwing, which makes it an even more impressive number when you consider the increase. So we take a, a ligament from the wrist. Most people have a little extra ligament here. Sometimes we'll take a little extra one from your hamstring. Won't bore you with those details, but we drill a bunch of holes and we just make a new one. This is the most important slide Okay, this is the most important slide. That surgery does not make anybody better. It does not make you a better pitcher. It will not make a college pitcher, a pro pitcher. It won't make a double A guy into a single or a triple A pro guy. The, the best good result is to get that person back to their previous level of pitching. And so if your God-given talent is such that you are destined to be a pro athlete and you have this surgery, about two-thirds of the time you're going to be able to get back and be a pro athlete. But it's not the sort of thing where if you're a pretty darn good high school pitcher, you have this thing when you're a sophomore that all of a sudden you're going to come out fireballing and every college in the southeast is going to be looking at you. It does not work that way. And this is, for whatever reason, a myth that just continues to be pervasive throughout baseball. It does not make you better. It's a phenomenal surgery because prior to Tommy John, who was unfortunately Yankee, if you had this injury, your career was over. And it was a phenomenal surgery because you can fix it. And then if you're somebody like Tommy John with that God-given talent, you go back to the pros and continue your career. And so there are dozens and dozens and dozens of pros that have had it done and they're back throwing and it's all great. But there are none of those pitchers that are better because of it. They're just, their career was saved. So I'm starting to babble on here. Let's get to the pitch count thing. So there's a lot of studies that we do and this is one that, that kind of led to and helped us develop the number of pitches. And so what was done was looking at, at 1,158 baseball players in high school, that's a lot, who had UCL surgery. They had the surgery, and then we went back and we looked and we asked all of them the same questions about how many innings they throw, how old were you when you threw a curveball, how many showcases did you do, and we asked them a million questions. We looked at righty versus lefty, all these things. And the presumed risk factors were that, basically, you played baseball year-round, you played too many games in one season, too many games in one weekend. Maybe you started throwing breaking balls a little early. Maybe you throw extra hard. Maybe you throw without warming up, okay? So seasonal overuse basically means, again, in season, you're playing on so many teams that you never actually get any adequate rest. And so these numbers you're all familiar with. And there's a grid depending on age, depending on uh, basically age, how many pitches you throw, how many days of rest you need. And so these are the recommendations that came out of those studies about how old you should be before you throw the pitch listed next to it. Now, everyone in this room's throwing curveballs. 
Not even messing around with your buddies? Okay, good. Because messing around with your buddies is one thing, but trying to use that as a pitch in a game is another. And what Dr. Andrews will tell people is that until you are old enough to shave, don't throw a curveball. And what that means, if you're shaving, you're skeletally mature, everything is nice and strong in the bones, and you can start throwing different junk pitches. But that's the recommendation, okay? And the bottom line is, and I think most of your coaches in this room will tell you that at all the levels of the people in this room, if you can throw a good fastball with control and a changeup, you're going to pretty much be one of the best pitchers out there anyway. You don't really need a junk pitch. Um, let me go back to this slide because these top three really, if you think about it, these are kind of in order of importance. This was the number one offending risk factor, never stopping, okay? Either, either never stopping baseball or going from baseball to the quarterback back to baseball. And, and if you think in a, as a common theme, it's basically a volume of pitches, whether it's too many in one game, too many in one week, too many in one season, too many in one year. And that's why these pitch counts are very important. Now, they are guidelines. Nobody's arm's gonna fall off if they throw 66 pitches, okay? Obviously, there are people who throw more warm-ups than others, but the presumption is this, is that everybody is going to have about the same number of warm-up pitches between innings as the next guy. The, the differentiation is how many pitches per inning. You might have a three-pitch inning. You might have a 30-pitch inning. Okay, you get three ground balls, good for you. You get in trouble. On paper, it's one inning, but on your arm, you throw 10 times as many pitches. So that's why the number of pitches is important because, you know, I get asked a lot, do the five pitches of warm-up count towards a 65? Well, no, because that's kind of assumed to be the baseline for everybody, and it's the throws on top of that that start to add up. Questions? You guys want to get more food? Yes. There was, I played with anywhere from five to like seven pitches for a new little time to mm -hmm. I know two of them never played again, but um, at least two of the other ones, there was a big jump in their velocity. So they were upper 80 pitchers, whether it was college or early in the minor leagues. Mm -hmm. That throwing big time. Is there another Anec anecdotal evidence. So that's five of seven. So that that five of seven, or two that didn't get back, that correlates pretty much to, you know, what you see when you look at 1,200. So when they looked at 1,200, they found that in general, the vast majority of people returned to the previous level of play, and yes, some of them did matriculate on and play a little bit more. But their improvement in velocity is more than likely due to perhaps a change in mechanics. Probably they're being a lot better about you know, keeping an eye on, on their delivery, on their day's rest, on their general conditioning than they were before they had surgery. It may also be just maturity. Was that person a uh, you know, 18-year-old high school kid and then 20, when he's 22 years later and he's recovered, he's put on 20 pounds of muscle He's a more mature athlete, probably going to throw faster for that reason. And so I, I don't have an answer for you. It's a good question. But I can tell you that the science is very clear that the ligament does not make you a better pitcher. Can it be like a, that they've already started having a problem before they had the surgery, so they were throwing a so partial injury? Or Meaning that they lost velocity and, and got... They never reached the peak. Yeah, absolutely. So, so one of the, the warning signs, one of the early warning signs in almost every major league and, and collegiate pitcher is that they lose velocity first. There are very few that have a pop and just walk off the, the mound in a heap. Most of them all of a sudden inexplicably can't you know, get it up there as easily as they could before. And they probably don't say much. And then, you know, who knows, maybe they go through a whole season of kind of struggling with velocity. Then they lose control then they get a little ache, maybe they get a little numbness tingling, and that's, that's the progression of symptoms that we see. So another great question. Um, obviously they play a role, but that was something that was looked at in the study as well. They looked at 
side armors, three quarters, overhead, and the type of delivery did not matter. And so you obviously need mechanics to be a good pitcher, but even though you may, uh, you know, the, I think you may see a little bit more strain on the shoulder if your mechanics are not perfect, but in terms of this injury at the elbow, it was a far lower concern as a risk factor than simply the number of pitches. Which is counterintuitive because you can look at some kids on the mound and you, and you shriek and go, oh, that kid's going to hurt himself. But again, when, when you have the experience that Andrews has and you've done thousands of these, you know, you have anecdotal stories like this and like that. We could go all day long from major leaguers telling stories and, and you know, you have to do it scientifically. So when you look at 12 or 1,300 of them in all these different studies, that was just one of a dozen or so that has been done. These are the sorts of things that tease out every time, volume of pitching. Yes? Um, I have no doubt that the, the advent of travel baseball directly correlates with your stats uh, increasing greatly. Yeah. Um, on the stat thing at the beginning, isn't part of that the fact that you've come so far in the ability to do it so well that more people are electing to do it, um, as well as the fact that maybe back then they didn't throw as much or something? So I, I think that the answer to that is, is partially yes, because in you know, 1995, there weren't very many people doing this surgery. I mentioned when I trained, which was a little bit after that, I didn't see very many. Um, and there were all kinds of reasons for that. There, there just weren't very many people who understood it. There aren't that many doctors treating professional athletes. And then as you know, people who had the surgery came back and did very well, become household names, there was more interest generated in the orthopedic community, more people train. I mean, if, if, you, if you look at the number of fellows trained by Dr. Andrews cumulatively over the same time, the number actually probably goes like that as well. And so, in some ways, yeah, there's more availability of surgeons who can do it. However, it's, it's such a relatively rare injury across the population that it, it still correlates much more to the number of kids playing baseball and the number of kids playing baseball year-round. Um, you know, it's an interesting theory. If we have a hammer, everything's a nail. But I'd like to think that, that most of us would not do the surgery unless it was warranted. And most of the time, you know, you're telling people, to, you're steering them away. Try rest, try this, try injections. And only after all that fails do you say, okay, let's do this. If I could do one more. Yeah. The micro injuries, which everybody's going to encounter, it's just part of the wear and tear of throwing. Um, if you do take two, five, whatever months um, off during the season from throwing, or during the year from throwing. Uh, it, this guy's from 14 down. Um, do these guys recover 100% by the time they throw baseball again? On, in general. In general, yeah. I mean, I think in order to know that at the cellular level, would have to do biopsies and that kind of thing. But if you, if you parallel that to what happens when you're building muscle, when these guys work out and they lift weights, they feel the burn. When you and I do it, we feel the same thing. We all know that we're not going to build muscle as quickly as the 15-year-olds are. Okay, and, the, and what's happening when you build muscle is that you are creating micro tears in the fibers that then rebuild themselves. And 15-year-olds do it a lot better than you and I do it and more effectively. And so the assumption is that yes, when they're symptom-free and their examination is normal, meaning no tenderness, full range of motion, that they have recovered fully. Now, I wish there were a wand to kind of wave over the shoulder and elbow to figure out if that's definitely true. But again, all we have are, are guidelines for that I'm kind of thing. I'm certainly talking about people who are injured even, or even feel pain. Um, just the fact that if you do get right there, and then, right. you know, will it report for their repair basically 98% or if you don't go? Yeah. No, I think that just like if you work out a muscle group, you, you're sore for two, three days. That's why the more work, the longer the, the period of rest for the arm. Yes, sir. Sorry. We'll go in back first. There is. And I wish I had the function that we had when I gave this talk at the high school. 
because there is an app that covers everything that you just asked. And it's an app that um, basically, Dr. Andrews has worked hand in hand with Kevin Wilkes, who's a PhD in rehab, and he's done all the PT and all these guys for decades, and has done a lot of these studies with Dr. Andrews. And they filmed every throwing exercise you can imagine. They filmed every stretch that you can imagine. They incorporated a pitch count machine that automatically lets you dial in age. You go through the pitch count. It tells you how many days rest. There's all kinds of things on this app, and it's called Throw Like a Pro. So Throw Like a Pro is the app, in case you dads want to spend nine bucks or whatever it is. It's a pretty, pretty cool app, and it has all these things on video. Um, and there's obviously much more extensive when you, when you get into that situation where you're looking to do a full program coming into a season. But yeah, there's absolutely a way to keep yourself in, tuned and rotator cuff ready and all that stuff. Yeah. It, it's something, it, it's, it's, that's more of a mechanics question. So it, it shouldn't, but I, it goes back to our mechanics, one of the reasons for Tommy John surgeries, and, and it is, but it's a much lower concern than the number of pitches. But I think that throwing a curveball requires perfect mechanics to avoid the sore arm. And in general, younger guys aren't going to have those mechanics down yet. And so, you know, that's the, the recommendation. That part of it, in all honesty, is not nearly as scientific that's, that's a recommendation. It seems to be a fairly universal one. Um, but it, that is more of a breakdown of having the right mechanics to throw it. Well, I think because of the, st the stress, you know, biomechanically, if you get in this lab and you put all these things on and you stress different people throwing and you measure velocities, you can tell the amount of torque that comes across each body part. And so throwing a curveball creates a bit more torque in your elbow than throwing a fastball. But it's not likely to be an issue unless you're throwing lots and lots and lots of them. And then if you add on top of that perhaps a little bit of poor mechanics, it just snowballs the effect of micro-injury. Yeah, I was just going to piggyback on that. You know, the American um, Sports Medicine Institute research really shows that the curveball has no correlation with injury in young pitchers. But makes, that's the only thing I would like on that chart is kind of being on the wrongness of the curveball. And this research clearly suggests that it's not good. But I, to your point, I think as long as it's on the right and not with the reasons, the kids who hurt their arm, the kids who throw hard early in two months. Right. I remember the kids throwing hard and, and, and the old antiquated wide tails and yeah. I mean, it, when when he asked those questions directly, so the ASMI stuff is is Andrew's; those are all his numbers. But he he won't take that off either, yeah. and so he'll admit that it's not nearly as scientific as some of the other recommendations and the pitch counts and everything. But it's still in there, and he'll still tell you you shouldn't do it. And he's up here with gray hair and a lot more experience than I have, and he'd probably answer the question better than I can. But you know, if you break it down to the science, you're right. It's not up. It's not up on the list of of concerns as much as these other things. All right. Any other questions? You guys want to get more food because it's gonna go in the trash. Hang on, hang on, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> hey, mine needs to eat. <laughs> Uh, guys, let's give Dr. O'Grady a yeah. I want to make a quick comment or two, and then uh, Dr. O'Grady will give us a tour of the Exos facility next door. Um, we get questions a lot from parents, from kids. Hey, how come Wave doesn't play longer? How come you only play six months out of the season? Well, a couple reasons. One, we want you to play other sports. It's in your best interest to play other sports. And number two, we don't want you to hurt your arm. Your coaches are looking out for your best interest. They're very well educated on this, and they want you to be able to continue to come back and play the next year. 
So I appreciate Dr. O'Grady taking a proactive effort for kids. You guys need to know this. It's your arm, your body, and it's good for you to be informed and educated. And uh, we're going to continue to try to do this on a year-to-year -year basis as our organization evolves and we continue to get better ourselves. So thanks for coming tonight. Knock the food out over here. Thank, Thank him again. again. And then we'll go next door in just a moment with him.